So sharing your faith, what others? Apostle, I'm just looking at the word apostle in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1, and it comes up. There are two kinds of apostles, pretty much. Apostle is a messenger, apostle relative to Christ. Every believer is an apostle of Christ in the sense of providing a message being required to, commanded to, share your faith, what you learn in the doctrines of the faith, beginning, of course, with the gospel. And when you do that, you're a messenger, your, your message is what it is, and taking uh, into account what everybody else says it is, which it isn't, you have to say what it actually is according to Scripture, and what it isn't according to everybody else who doesn't go by Scripture. It's 50-50, it's because so many people will say, for example, Confession is part of the requirement for an individual to be saved unto eternal life, but the key word is it's not and part of the requirement for an individual to be saved unto eternal life. Well, what about yeah? What about this? Then you have to know what about where are we going? Where are we going? Where do you think we're going? Romans ten nine to ten, right? And then there are those who can require confession, even in public, of Jesus as Lord in order to be saved. Some redefine confession as a continual effort in every area of one's life to do works in order to be eventually saved, in spite of the fact that the action is presented as a single one-time event resulting in a once-for-all-time salvation in the passage itself. Everybody wants to be an editor, and then they go off on their own tangent. Oh, everybody's a mathematician here. But the Word of God is not mathematics. The Word of God is how to have eternal life by virtue of the normative rules of language, context, and logic. Even mathematics has its own rules. You know, you don't take a, a tangent improperly. This false concept, going out on a, on a limb, is a, extracted from Scripture by taking Romans 10 to 9, 9 to 10, 10, 9, and 10, out of context and redefining words beyond their available meanings. Here's a perfect example of this. This is one of the most popular salvation passages, yet it has something to do with the salvation, the temporal salvation of the individual who then establishes a pattern of a faithful Christian life. Why would Paul add this element in, in Romans chapter 10, when he didn't mention it and it excluded it for nine chapters before this? The question answers itself. The truth of the matter is that the passage presents the confession is coming after the fact of being justified by faith alone. Nine chapters of Paul writing, and then you throw that in the trash and you want to go with Romans chapter 10. That's the first uh, words in the book of Romans, the letter to the uh, Roman believers, right? That, no, it isn't. It's the 10th chapter. So, the truth of the matter is that the passage presents the confession is coming after the fact of being justified by faith alone, and it is in the subjective mood, which is an objective possibility. Here it is. Paraphrase. Possible result is that you will confess. Maybe you will, and maybe you won't. Now let's look at that passage before I get a chance to. I should put that in there, actually. Quoted ahead of time. Romans chapter 10. But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. This is the word of faith which we are preaching. That if, we can, if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And then it explains it. See, if you stop reading, oh, okay. No, for with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness. Isn't that eternal life, what Paul's been preaching for nine chapters before this? Oh, no, let's just ignore the next verse. Cut it right out before you actually finish. It's a semicolon right here, right? So it's continuing. Wait till you get to the period at least. No. And with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. So two things seem to be happening. You believe? Righteousness unto eternal life. That's what Paul said for nine chapters. And then, after that, he confesses, Jesus is Lord, resulting in salvation. Maybe it's a different kind of salvation. You think? Wow. So,
let's put it up here. I think I'll put these verses up here and I'll fix them later. Romans 10, 8 to 10, NASB. I just read these. So it's paraphrased. The possible result, if you, it says if, if you do this, then the result will be, if you don't do it, then won't, you won't get the result, right? The possible result is that you will confess, maybe you will and maybe you won't, it's your, up to you, with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. And this is ongoing as a result of the cause that you believed in your heart that God raised him from the dead, which belief alone is that which results in your being saved. You're being declared, D-E-C-L-A-R-E-D, -E -E righteous unto salvation, unto eternal life. Two kinds of salvation. That's the first one which Paul emphasized over and over and over again for nine chapters. And we get to ten. Now, what is this confession? So confession that Jesus is Lord is an expected, but not certain, because again, the verse begins with if. Remember, look at, look at the verses up here. Where is the ear and mouth? That is the word of faith which we are preaching that if. If, 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 if. Maybe you will, maybe you won't. It's your choice. And it's an ongoing thing in the Christian life. So, confession that Jesus is Lord is an expected but not certain response for believers to express as a result of, but not a requirement for salvation unto eternal life. But what about the other? So some will confess, and sad to say, some will not. Just as some will be water baptized, go to church regularly, lead faithful lives, and some will not. You see. Now we look at that, we want to look at that uh, later on. Move to examination of the word confession relative to salvation. Extremely important point because people major on this issue, and I think I should do a separate YouTube on it. Salvation, the preservation of your life as a Christian for its value for eternal rewards and for blessings in this life and for releasing of the discipline and provision of blessing if you're under God's judgment for not doing the right things in this life. How often is that? Every day. Every day. Confess and move on your sins. Confess and move on and stay under blessings and you let God redirect your life at least in some nominative direction in the, in the godly direction. Next point. Obedience in order to be saved. Obedience. Obeying the gospel. What is that? What's the gospel? Christ died for your sins. Okay, that's the gospel. That's the good news. It's good if you believe in it. Faith alone in Christ alone. Finally, in answer to those, after all of this, who still maintain that there are passages in God's word which demand an obedience of works by an individual in order to be saved unto eternal life. See, what are we doing? We're doing what Peter said. Be ready with an answer. We have to know what the question is. The questions which aren't biblical, they say, well, how come you say it's faith alone? I say, no. I say you have to go with Romans chapter 9, 10, 9 and 10, right? Because it says you have to confess. That's something you have to do. And you have to be, do that to be saved. And then I, I, I know the answer. Well, which salvation are you talking about? And they go, what? What is, which? What do you mean which? Well, you know, if I say, hey, don't cross the street. Now the bus is coming. You'll be run over. Did I give you eternal life? No, you just didn't get killed early. Wow. You know, I put a lot of money in the bank. I took my whole paycheck and put it in the bank. I didn't spend it on something unworthy, right? What'd you do? Did you get eternal life to the bank? No. You know, you, you preserve the value of your life. Get your full longevity. Get the blessings in your life. Get rewards in heaven. Then your life is worth something in eternity because all the temporal stuff you leave behind when you get your resurrection body. Consider that. Look to eternal life every day. So you work on your, your temporal life for sure. Stay healthy. Good night's sleep. Exercise. Good diet. Stay working in the Word of God and explain what you've learned in the Word of God to people. That gives your life an eternal value. 
Everything else is to build up for that. Not as a result, I'll squeeze it in at the end of the day when I'm tired. So, A, obey Christ and he becomes your source of eternal life. What does that mean? Trusting alone in Christ alone. Here it is, Hebrews 5, 9b. How many people have taken this out of context? He, Jesus, became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. All right, now you pluck this out of its context. What do we have before Hebrews chapter 5, verse 9b? You have four chapters and eight verses. Did you bother reading that? Why would Hebrews 5, 9b throw that in the trash? Yeah, it went the book of Hebrews, you open it up. Don't read anything until you get the, you start with Hebrews 5, 9b. It doesn't say that. You start with Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. Build the context. Don't forget, who wrote this? Who inspired this to be written? Human authors, the Holy Spirit wrote it, and God's intended words are not to be uh, jumped around and cherry-picked out of context. So, obey. Upakasusin. This word which is translated obey is Greek. However, it is a word reflecting the Jewish author's mentality, which encompasses not just obedience in deed, but also obedience of faith. Now, you know, there's some things we're commanded in the Ten Commandments, for example. And this is uh, reiterated, all but uh, nine of the Ten Commandments are reiterated in the New Testament. And these are mental, some of those commandments. Right? Don't uh, covet something of your neighbor. Some say that salvation requires one to obey in deeds due to a verse like this with the word obey in it. So how do you obey in deeds? Don't covet your neighbor's wife or his belongings. You actually do nothing. Your mentality doesn't focus on something you would like to have and, and resent the other person for having it. What deeds did you do? It's just a mental act, uh, attitude. Change that attitude. Being glad for your neighbor for having something that you don't have. But being glad that you don't actually covet it, too. Some say that salvation requires one to obey in deeds due to a verse like this with the word obey in it. But in the Jewish mind, if you trust or believe, then you thereby obey. The Ten Commandments, there you go. Okay, I didn't realize I mentioned this. The Ten Commandments, for example, prohibit a number of mental attitude sins, such as covetousness. There it is. To disobey one of these mental attitude commandments is to have that mental attitude of covetousness, for example. No actual deeds required. If one believed that covetousness was a sin and did not practice such a mental attitude, then one was obeying that commandment within one's mind and without any actions. Therefore, faith in Christ as Savior is indeed obeying the gospel of salvation by simply exercising a mental assent, a simple trust in Christ. And somebody say, well, yeah, if you believe it, if you believe Jesus died for your sins, then you'll act right. Who said that? Here's a guy you can't exercise, whatever reason. Maybe he's injured, maybe he just can't. Is there a wheelchair? And he says, I, well, I think that, I believe that exercise is good for my health. But he doesn't exercise. So he's not really believing exercise is good for his health? Or he has conflict, or he's too busy, or he's too tired. A lot of reasons. He doesn't uh, have the self-discipline to get out there and do it every day. Well, that doesn't mean he doesn't believe ex uh, exercise is good for your health. But don't be an editor, and don't transform Webster's Dictionary into your own definition uh, area. John 6, 27 to 29. Have we seen this before? Right? Play on words, figure of speech. Jesus answered. Our Lord explicitly states that the work that one must do for eternal life is exclusively a matter of faith. That's what Jesus said. We'll read the verse. So to obey the Lord unto eternal salvation must necessarily be to obey his command, to trust alone in him alone for eternal life, no deeds required. Remember, Jesus answered, Do not work for food that spoiled, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. On him God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Then they asked him, Well, what must we do to do the works God requires? He's already said this a number of times. Didn't, they didn't pick up on it. Jesus answered, The work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. He's already said, Believe on me, on the bread of life. Our, our Lord picks up on the word work, which the disciples used, but not in a literal sense, and provided the answer, which is no work at all, but to simply to believe in Jesus Christ as Savior. So I gave you